Are you feeling like you don't have the energy, stamina, or sex drive that you used to? Low testosterone may be the reason why, but don't worry because Man TF Up is here to help. Right now, Man TF Up is offering our listeners 20% off of your order when you visit mantfup.com slash unfiltered. That's M-A-N-T-F-U-P dot com forward slash unfiltered for 20% off Man TF Up's testosterone booster. The links are in the episode description. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to an incredibly special episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my overwhelmingly special guest today, I just want to give a quick shout out to Care of Vitamins, who makes taking your supplements so incredibly easy. All you have to do is go to takecareof.com and take a quick five-minute quiz, and they will personally curate your own vitamin plan just for you. Make sure you use code HOLLY to get 50% off of your first box. Okay, so when I say like today's guest is overwhelmingly special, um, I I don't have enough adjectives to like describe how excited I am to have her here today. Um, you definitely know who she is, and she hasn't done an interview in many, many years. So this is really – we're very fortunate to have her here today. Um, she was thrust into the international news cycle in 2014 after she suffered life-threatening domestic abuse at the hands of her MMA fighter ex-boyfriend. But that is not where her story started or where it ends. And I am so honored to have the opportunity to interview the incredibly strong and talented Christy Mack. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. I have been following your interviews for basically forever. Oh my gosh. Thank <laughs> and you. And it's truly an honor to be here. Thank you. I feel like the same way. I was honestly like truly surprised when you reached out to me. <laughs> and as such last minute, you've been wonderful in accepting me and gracious enough to really set this up within a couple of days because I didn't know I was coming out. And you're the first person that popped into my mind when I've got an extra day. I really need to contact her. Wow. Yeah, and I like rearranged my schedule. Like I figured you did, and I, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's totally fine. I mean, to be honest, like the only thing on my schedule today was like maybe recover from, I did the browser spring social last night, so I was gonna like maybe take a nap. But I feel like I could skip a nap to, to interview you, it's fine. It is later in the day. I mean, you could have slept in a little bit, you know, have a little extra you time. Well, I do have a two-year-old. That's so true. I That's, don't get there to, is no sleeping in. There is no sleeping in. <laughs> Totally understandable. So now that we've like jerked off all over each other because we're like so excited to be here. <laughs> there was a moment when we were outside and it was just like the instant, huh, I get red immediately and I will get red several times throughout this episode, I'm sure of it. Okay. I've even put makeup on my chest, but like, <laughs> oh wow, I just, I instantly flush. And when you were doing your quick intro, I was like, mm -hmm. it's kind of weird <laughs> to hear that about yourself, like those you know, to hear yourself described in such a way by somebody else. I get that way, too, whenever I do interviews. I'm it's like, oh. so flattering. And yeah. like, oh, my gosh. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, okay. Real quick, going to stop. Masha, can you take the, the paperwork off? Okay. Let's cut that part out. Okay. I would like to keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, fine. Christy says we can keep it in. We can keep it in. <laughs> All right, so Christy, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about today, but let's start about the evolution of Christy Mack. So let's talk about the very beginning. How did you get started in the adult industry? So it's actually very interesting. Right after high school, actually during high school, I started doing photo shoots. Um, I just wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a late bloomer. Um, I didn't have a ton of male attention in high school and directly following high school. But I wanted to be out there. I was very confident in my body. It, I looked nothing like this a decade ago. Mm. Um, very flat chested. Still had an ass though. Mm, okay. Yeah. That was, well, that's that was, important. That was already there. But um, I just wanted to show off my body. So I started doing photo shoots as soon as I turned 18. And it had never occurred to me that I could do pornography. I had never even seen porn. It was never 
never an option, never a thought. And right after high school, my roommate, her mother, said, you know what you should do? You should do porn. Fuck off. Oh, absolutely. Her mother said her that? Her mother said that to me. Really? Yeah. And I was like, well, let me let me look into it. <laughs> and, and I had watched a few, you know, things on why browsers. You, and Why do you think she said that? I have no fucking clue. To this day, not any idea why she would say that to me. An 18-year-old... I mean, at least you were 18. <laughs> I was 18. Yeah. Yes. Um, freshly 18. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, I could probably do that. <laughs> and, and but, was, uh, but you'd never seen porn before. No. So what did you think that, what were you like envisioning when she said that? And you were like, yeah, I could do that. Like, what was in your head? I honestly, I can't even remember the train of thought from back then. But when she said, you, you, should, you should do porn, I was like, well... Obviously, if this trusted adult is telling me that I mean, that's clearly. an option, yeah. I should look into this. And then when I when I did, when I watched a few things of porn, I was like, oh, this seems interesting. Uh, I grew up very poor mm -hmm. in, from a trailer park in Indiana. Um, so we didn't have nice things. I didn't have a surplus of food. There were days that I would go without eating. And I was like, whoa. This is a way I could make money. I could get the attention that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I could really wrap everything into one. So it seemed like the ideal option for me. Wow. Yeah. So what were the first porn scenes that you watched? Um, Just, you know, I did the normal things that I think most people do. I went on Pornhub and I just looked at the front page. Mm. <laughs> what year was this? This would have been 2009. Okay. Yeah, 2009, 2010. Was the stepbrother, stepsister a thing? It not, wasn't a thing then. Not yeah, then. Was it? No. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't a thing yet, mm -hmm. which I, I still, to this day, I'm like, how, of all things, is this... It's still a thing. This is it. Yeah, there's still a lot of it out there. <laughs> yeah, the whole world just decided that this is the direction to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you decided that porn was something that you could do. Yeah. What were your next steps from there? So from there... I started doing more risque photo shoots, more spread shots, things like that. Um, I got into contact with someone on Facebook from down in Florida, mm -hmm. and she was like, you have a very interesting look. I had begun getting tattooed when I was 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. um, and I had a mohawk. She's like, you have a very interesting look. It's something different from the rest of the industry right now. I think we can do something with this. Mm -hmm. You're 18 years old. You've got all the time in the world. Yeah. What she was really saying is, let me take advantage of you, because you're very young. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> um, but I flew down to Florida the next month, I want to say, and they told me that I didn't have any sort of career in porn. I didn't have any future. I was never going to book anything because I did look so different. I was... You didn't fit that I didn't, cookie cutter. I didn't fit the mold. Yeah. At the time, it was blonde, huge boobs, mm -hmm. girl next door, no ass kind of thing. Like, that was... Mm -hmm. And definitely no tattoos. Definitely no tattoos. Yeah. And at this point, we were moving more into 2012 by the time, like, I started shooting actual videos. Mm -hmm. um, and... I was really disheartened by that. I, yeah. The manager that I was working with at the time told me that I needed to put extensions on the side of my head because uh, I had the mohawk, of course, mm -hmm. the signature look that I had for years. So he had me put extensions in, which looked like absolute shit. Now mm -hmm. that I look back, I'm, oh, honey, like it was terrible. Yeah. Um, and had me like cover up as much of the tattoos as I could and really just wanted to change my look to fit more of the industry standard at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but after my first couple of shoots for Bang Bros, I hit number one on their site. Like, wow. immediately. Were you surprised? Absolutely. Because I was told that I was never going to have any sort of success. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I believed. I'm 18 years old. I'm a what are you what are you supposed to think? Yeah. Um and then the person his name was Andy. He was like um model liaison and he's like, We want you to take the extensions out of the side of your head. We really want to see 
you. And mm-hmm. we want to brand you as like a, a rocker girl, this really intense look. And I was like, oh, okay. Which mm-hmm. is funny because I never did, though I was doing hardcore porn, it was not super aggressive. I was a very vanilla performer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've seen anything, but very vanilla, like just casual. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say like from the other tattooed performers that I've spoken to, one of the thing, one of the biggest complaints is that because they're heavily tattooed, they only get cast in these really intense scenes yeah. with that are very rough, maybe a lot of BDSM, which mm-hmm. is not necessarily what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was never the direction that I went into. Mm-hmm. I wasn't comfortable with it, really. Um, and at this point, let's see, I was getting closer to 19, 20 years old when they wanted to brand me as, you know, the rocker chick. Mm-hmm. And I was fine with it. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't going to do a lot of the harder ram things down your throat and up your ass at the same time mm-hmm. kind of stuff. I yeah. just wasn't comfortable with it. Right. And they really respected that, which was wonderful for me. This was at Bang Bros? Yeah. Okay. Bang and Brazzers and really any of the production companies that I shot with. Right. They were always very respectful of my boundaries and what I was doing as a performer. That's great. Yeah. You don't- hear that story a lot especially back then like the industry is so different now yeah back then it wasn't models didn't necessarily get that kind of consideration oh absolutely and I think I am extremely lucky for getting that consideration and treatment especially Mm -hmm. a decade ago yeah (laughs) it was unheard of pretty much especially for someone with my look do you think that you were good at setting your boundaries because you know how sometimes people like It's that vibe that you give off. Like some girls, people feel like they can take advantage of some girls because they feel like they probably won't push back. Do you think that you like came off stronger, like you would push back or would you push back? I do think that I was more assertive with what I wanted and what I demanded of my set and my boundaries. I wasn't uh, like a giggly, do whatever kind of person. Mm -hmm. I was there for business. Um, I was there to work. We're going to get the scene done. I'm Mm -hmm. going to give you exactly what you need. You're going to pay me and I'm going to leave. Um, And that's how I was the entire time. Mm. And I think since I didn't blur any kind of lines with making a lot of friends outside of set and, you know, showing up two hours late. Like, I was respectful of their time, and they were ex- they were respectful of my time and boundaries. Yeah. So um, I think that really helped me a lot. So I want to go back to your actual first scene, um, which you said you did with Bang Bros. Can you walk me through what that experience was as much as you remember it? You know, how you felt walking in? Was it what you expected? How you felt afterwards? So I can't remember if it was Bang Bros or Reality Kings down in Miami. Yeah, there's for yeah for my very <laughs> first scene. Um, it was with another girl. I cannot remember her name. Um, and we were supposed to be doing a threesome with another younger guy. Uh, we showed up to wherever we were signing our, you know, the the things that we do ahead of time. Yeah, model releases. Yeah, model releases and, you know, doing the bunny ears and all of that. And then we got shuttled to this dingy room somewhere. And I was like, fuck, I'm going to get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is not, yeah. this is not the best decision I've ever made. But, like, at least I had another girl with me. Yeah, right, right. Like, one of us can run. Yeah. But, um. <laughs> Distract. <laughs> yeah. Like, take her first. Please. <laughs> I'm faster. No. <laughs> Very aerodynamic. <laughs> but, um, so we showed up and we were in, like, this felt like a dorm room or like a motel room, very dingy and dark. And I was like, oh, this Mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. And then this young guy, well, we're also young, but this young guy comes in and we start fooling around and doing the thing for camera. And he can't stay hard. Mm. They send in another stunt cock. Oh, no. (laughs) They send in another guy. Oh, no, they sent him home. It was that bad. Oh, yeah, that bad. Um, 
And this is like two or three hours later, we get another guy, still can't perform. We get another guy. Wait, 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 wait. This is your first scene? It's my first scene. And the first two guys oh, yeah. fail? Mm-hmm. Oh, you must have been like, this is bullshit. I was horny. I didn't care. <laughs> Did you at least like the girl? Oh, yeah. She was great. Okay. Was, well, thank God. Yeah. She was great. We had a good time together. We were making fun of the guys, like, mm-hmm. having a good time. Wow. <laughs> and then we got the third guy, and it was good to go. <laughs> and then we went home happy, and I was like, cool. We got paid. <laughs> I'm like, this is the most money I've ever seen. Cool. <laughs> and at the time, it was probably like $600, and I was like, oh, the rich i know right (laughs) i know a lot of times i hear like that that first like this is more money than i've ever made in a week oh absolutely it's crazy (laughs) i can't believe like two guys failed and that was not the only time that that had happened wow yeah i did the bang bus bang bus uh later on Mm -hmm. and i stole the guy's wallet i kicked several dudes out of the bus because they couldn't perform one couldn't get hard one couldn't come like and I think I, I think it was four dudes in that I finally got the scene done. What? The but they fuck? were paying me extra for every dude, so I was like, "Cool." Oh wow! Send in more. Wow. <laughs> as long as it's one at a time, what was it? I don't care. Yeah. They're all tested. It's good to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. That's always like the worst too when a guy can't perform. It's like you feel so bad for him, but it's also like frustrating for everybody else, and it's just like an awkward. Oh, situation. absolutely. And when you do like the dorm invasion kind of things, like they're, they're young guys that have never done this before and they think it's going to be so cool to bang a porn star yeah. and it's going to be the best thing ever and all of my friends are going to be so jealous. But then they see a camera and they see five dudes that are there with like a boom and with cameras yeah. and lights and then they're like oh no this isn't sexy at all no it's so <laughs> different it's like yeah i mean the expectation versus the reality is i experienced it's a lot jarring. of that yeah when i did my the when i hosted a playboy tv show it was a lot of that because it was all like supposed to be couples who had never had sex before mm-hmm. in front of the camera so everybody was brand new and the fail rate was like 80 percent. oh i can imagine it was bad i've seen it yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard. It's not, you know, for every guy who DMs me and is like, I want to be a porn star. Like, it is not an easy job. I'm going to tell you this for the 10,000th time. <laughs> do like, you want to be a porn star? Do you really? Or, or do you just want to fuck a porn star? Yeah. And because yeah. they're very different. They are very and different. You, <laughs> it's not the same. No, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so you've done your first scenes. You kind of feel like you're getting into this. Is there Was there any one point or any one scene that made you think like, okay, this is something that I want to be serious about and I really want to see as a career? Or did you just kind of like just keep working and it just kept coming and time I, passed? I kind of just fell into it. Mm-hmm. I remember um, looking on the Bang Bros site and looking at how my scenes were performing and where I was ranking. And I remember feeling so hurt that they put a different name under one of my scenes or like had spelled my name wrong or something. And I was like, this is bullshit. Mm. (laughs) I should be taken more seriously. It's not like your name is hard to spell. No, truly. How did they spell it? I have no idea. I don't remember now. But I was like, I was so butthurt about it that I was like, well, if I'm getting this invested in it, it's not really becoming just a money thing anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm worried about branding. Mm-hmm. And that's when it hit me. I, if I'm thinking about taking it more seriously, I should really invest my time into it. And I did. <laughs> so what did that mean for you? Like taking it seriously as a brand? Like what were the next steps that you took to kind of ensure that? I stopped doing like the car show modeling and started spending more time thinking about what kind of outfits I could invest in to make myself more presentable for porn Mm -hmm. and thinking about how I should do my hair for porn and thinking about, you know, when can I spend time in LA or when can I spend time in Miami to, to do this? And it kind of became Mm all-consuming. I just completely threw myself into it. If I'm popular, then I should take advantage of this because Mm -hmm. I realized really early on, this is not a forever thing. This is not something that, especially back then, a decade ago, all they wanted were 18, 19, 20-year-old girls. Mm -hmm. And then you had Lisa Ann, and that's it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think I was ever going to be a Lisa Ann. Like, mm-hmm. I just thought I was going to be another throwaway girl mm-hmm. that could only make this work for three to six months. So mm-hmm. I was going to take advantage of that three to six months. Um, and so I did. <laughs> did you have like an exit plan? Did you think about what you might do afterwards? Not really. Because, you know, when you're young, you don't think yeah. that far in the future. Yeah. And even now, in my 30s, I'm like, what am I doing next week? I have no clue. <laughs> but um, I didn't really have an exit plan. I just mm-hmm. knew that I needed to save my money. Mm-hmm. Um, I never partied. I never went out. I never spent my money on anything. I wouldn't even buy myself a nice bag until I was... 29 years old is when I first got my first designer thing. Wow. <laughs> I was I just had that frugal mentality from growing up so destitute that it's you know, you don't you can't spend money on things and yeah. then it really sat with me that I could lose everything tomorrow mm-hmm. because it is such a short-term industry. Yeah. I held on to everything. Now I'll fly first class and I feel comfortable with it. And yeah. now I'll buy myself a nice pair of shoes, design like not even designer shoes, Nikes, mm-hmm. <laughs> a brand name. Yeah. And I'm completely comfortable with it. But when I was actually very active in the industry, I wouldn't spend money on anything. And that was a security blanket for me that made me feel comfortable not doing a five-year or 10-year plan past porn. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, as long as I had a nest egg, I could figure it out as I went. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like as much as you say that you weren't thinking ahead, like you were thinking ahead. Yeah. So somewhere in me, I was like, ah, well, yes, I need to think ahead and just keep money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, I just fell into porn and it stuck. Yeah. Do you, looking back now, do you think that 18 was a good time to get into porn or do you think you were too young? I think I was too young. Um, and it was a slow development between doing the photo shoots and you know the spread shots and all of that mm-hmm. and then transitioning to doing like fetish work and then transitioning into what i call real pornography right. with working with bang yeah um and so i think i had a good warm up and figured out what to expect along the way mm-hmm. and built on built on smaller steps i didn't really just Go straight into yeah. huge dick penetration. Yeah, DP. Like yeah, right off the bat. Yeah. yeah. So I think that made me feel more comfortable and helped me work into the industry a little bit. Yeah. But I think eighteen is too young. Yeah. <laughs> for for me, I should have waited. Um, I'm not going to say that I regret doing things that young, mm-hmm. but I think it could have worked out a little differently and maybe better if I had waited until I was, you know, 2021. Yeah. Do you think you would have made like better decisions or? I think so. Um, I think I maybe wouldn't have been as influenced as I was by the people around me, like the shady manager in Florida Mm -hmm. or the manager that I got out in LA that made some questionable decisions for me that I believed were in my best interest, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah. Do you think that, um, are there any regrets that you have that you made early on that you wish you hadn't made? A couple, actually. Back, you know, a decade ago, we did the system of when you get into porn, you typically do solo stuff, which you get paid very little for. Mm -hmm. And then you move up to the girl girl, which you still get paid very little for. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you'll do a boy girl and then you know all the way up Mm -hmm. you do anal dp Mm -hmm. and then you'll move on to interracial Mm. and i never got to that last step because my manager at the time was telling me don't do it it'll hurt your career yeah you will never be able to go back this is the only thing people will hire you for you will never be able to do anything else and i believed that yeah. I, and it was a totally different industry at the time. Yeah. And I think that was the wrong decision. Yeah. Truly. I think, you know, I could have done so much more and <laughs> worked with so many, worked amazing with so performers. many amazing performers yeah. that, you know, now it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you're not really, you're not working with other guys anymore, right? No, I haven't worked with other men. Um, so I was 
active with companies, shooting with companies for under two years. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, I haven't worked with other guys. Yeah. So it's really something that I can't take back, but yeah. it is one of my regrets. Does Does that come up for you ever? Oh, yeah, a ton. Yeah. Um, people call me racist all the time because I never did interracial. Right. And I can't spend, you know, 10 hours a day telling people, no, I definitely regret that decision. I re regret listening to my management at the time. And, yeah. you know, I wish I would have spent more time in the industry getting to, you know, work with those amazing performers. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And it's crazy, too. Like, I mean, you know, now and just in the last few years, finally, the industry has, like, come to realize oh, like, yeah. that's fucked up. Oh, yeah. You know, and I've had a lot of, like, people of color come on the podcast and talk about, like, you know, the interracial rate, how, mm -hmm. like, women were paid more to yeah. work with black men and, like, how insanely racist that is. Oh, absolutely. And and all of those things. And it's, like, it's kind of <clears> nuts <throat> to me now that it took the industry, like, this long to be like, oh, yeah, that is super fucked up. Yeah. Like, that is actually really racist. And that is just how the industry was. It just was. And, like, it wasn't even like really questioned no and it, it, it didn't make sense but you were just like you were told this and you're like oh, okay yeah <laughs> yeah and you were young and when you're young you're like well i guess you know if it's if it's not gonna if i can't do anything else then i guess yeah <laughs> and, and i is... just made it up to i did so i did like five anal scenes and then i did one dp and i was like i'm calling it yeah <laughs> and the dp was the last thing i ever did and i was like well <laughs> yeah. Well, and now, like, performers have so much more control over, like, their brand and what they shoot and stuff like that. So, you know, they're not – they don't live in the fear anymore being blacklisted for speaking out against things yeah. that are unfair. Oh, absolutely. In the industry, so – which I think has made it a better place. I completely agree. When the performers are given the power to – control their own production and really control their own bodies and what their limitations are. Yeah. It's amazing. We really have the power now. And I love that the younger girls in the industry can really take that and run. They mm -hmm. can do whatever they want. There are no limitations. They are as comfortable as they are. You can set up your cell phone and do it all yourself and people love it. You don't have to have the huge productions anymore. You don't have to go into makeup for three hours. You don't mm -hmm. have to sit around on a set for 15 hours to do a huge thing. Yeah, You can just have it personalized and you can be one-on-one -on -one yeah. and you can be completely comfortable at all times. Yeah. And that's what you're doing now, right? Is you're yes. doing just you're shooting only for your OnlyFans? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so my OnlyFans, the simple one at Christy Mac, is where I interact with my fans and I'll do my girl girls and I'll put up solo content. But then I have my other OnlyFans, which is unofficial Christy. And it's basically just me baking all of the time. Baking? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're a baker. Oh, I love baking. <laughs> really? What's yeah. your What's your like signature baking dish? Pies. Pie. Uh, I love pies. Thank you. I do, too. And <laughs> I, uh, my business is uh, Christie's Cream Pies. Wait, you have a cream pie business? Oh, yeah. Wait. What, I cannot. Uh, so I just do it for friends and, you know, Unofficially now, because where I live, it is against the cottage laws to make and send pies. Okay. <laughs> but Christie's cream pies, that's my, that's what I do. Oh, my God. Which I think is hilarious. I, I mean, clearly, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, all, we, we do love that joke. Yeah. But so you don't sell the pies. You just I make don't sell them. them. I just bake them and give them away. Oh, my God. <laughs> And That's I have, amazing. Yeah, I have a good time with it. Like, I'll, I do my friends' weddings. I do, you know, anything. Wow. And you have a whole OnlyFans dedicated to you baking pies? Essentially, yeah. I'll put up other things, but it's uh, even if I'm making, like, breakfast or something, I'll do, like, breakfast recipes. But mostly it's just me baking and putting up recipes and just having a good time. Are you topless? Or are you fully oh, no, clothed? Oh, no. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's fully clothed. And for the most part, every once in a while, I'll throw a titty in there. But oh, okay. that's, that's like nice. a, a little freebie. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that your baking skills can't stand on their own without the titties. I mean, Thank you. I don't know. I'm, I love a good pie. Like, what's your, like, signature pie dish? Um, My love is apple pies. 
Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So wholesome. Yes. Very. I'm a very wholesome character. <laughs> <laughs> if you wouldn't have guessed, but I love a good like berry crumble. Oh yeah. I know that's that's is that a pie even? Yeah. It's oh, completely. And uh, I crust. Mm -hmm. It's just like messy. I think anything anything with a crust counts as a pie. Wow. Yeah. I I um actually just started dabbling with a a four berry pie, mm -hmm. and it's delicious. I'll have to bring you one sometime. I will absolutely. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to bring me one all the way from the East Coast. But I'll figure will, it out. I will take it. Can you like FedEx it to me or something like that? Now, see, that's the illegal part. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not allowed to send the pies. You know, if anything that has to be frozen or refrigerated, I cannot ship. Wow. So, yeah. okay, I guess we don't need to get into the like the logistics of like shipping food. I feel like people didn't come here for that. They so, might have. I mean, you know what? Then you can go to unofficial Christy Mac on, on Facebook, on OnlyFans, and she can do a whole thing on shipping pies, shipping and freezing pies people, this episode. Yeah, people are like, can you send me one of these pies? And I'm like, well, no, <laughs> let me tell you why. And you're like, I actually just want to see your ass full. Oh man, well, I mean, delicious little, Special pie. Yeah. <laughs> Cream pies. Cream yeah. pies. God, it's so good. <laughs> All right, guys. We are going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about, um, obviously, the elephant in the room and, you know, how Christy has grown and healed from that experience. So make sure you stick around. We'll see you in just a minute. This episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Man TF Up. Are you feeling like you don't have the energy, stamina, or sex drive that you used to? Low testosterone may be the reason why, but don't worry because Man TF Up is here to help. Testosterone levels decrease as men age, typically beginning around the age of 30, but sometimes sooner. Did you know that 25% of men over 30 have low testosterone? And after 45, that statistic increases to around 40%? Man TF Up is an affordable and natural way to restore your testosterone levels without costly therapy or risky side effects. Man TF Up is the number one product on Amazon in the sexual enhancement category. And right now, Man TF Up is offering our listeners 20% off of your order when you visit mantfup.com slash unfiltered. That's M-A-N-T-F-U-P dot com forward slash unfiltered for 20% off Man TF Up's testosterone booster. You can also purchase Man TF Up on Amazon. You'll get 20% off when you use promo code UNFILTERED. The links are also in the episode's description. Okay, everyone, we are back. So, Christy, tell me a little bit about um, your family. Like, how early on did your family learn about what you did for a living? And what's your relationship like with them now? So I was very upfront with my family from essentially the beginning, I told my mom, my mom has always been very open with me, very supportive of all things. She raised me, um, telling me, as long as you're not hurting yourself or others, I don't care what you do. Mm -hmm. Be safe. Be safe about all that you do. Don't hurt yourself or anyone else. And I will always love you. Mm -hmm. And so I always carried that with me. So I was very upfront with her. And, you know, because they're especially back then, there was this huge stigma, this huge shame that went along with it. And I wanted her to be prepared. Um, and then shortly after, I told my brother, because if I'm going to be doing porn, obviously yeah. a young man, he's a, he's a young man. Yeah, yeah. is going to be a you consumer. You don't want to surprise him like that. Exactly. Yeah. And I think he felt hurt by it for a little bit. And it ruined <laughs> looking at porn sites for him, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we still have an amazing relationship today. I'm going to – he lives here in L.A., so I'm going to okay. see him after this. Oh, awesome. um, we're extremely close. We call each other every day. Um, and the same with my mom. Like, I'm very close with both of my family members. And it's, it's beautiful to have the love and support of your family when – you decide to enter an industry that could potentially harm them by association. Yeah, yeah. And we hear so many stories about families that disown their children and, you know, just like the turmoil that choosing a, a career in porn causes. So whenever I get to hear those stories about, like, parents Support. are supportive, it's yeah. like, it's really lovely. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. And I... My heart really hurts for people that don't have that kind of support system that I was so lucky to have. Yeah. Because it's not it's not the story for everyone. It's 
an ideal situation, but not everyone has that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's unfortunately, it's like the stigma around porn is so strong that it can like break families apart. But I find that when you dig a little deeper, usually there was some friction and some splintering there already. Oh, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Yeah. But luckily, like we were a family of three, mm -hmm. pretty much always. Mm -hmm. So we were all very well bonded and we always loved each other and supported each other no matter what. Um, and I think that just, you know, they stuck with me. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Christy, so as you and I had discussed previously, the incident between you and your ex, John, a.k.a. War Machine, back in 2014 was a huge piece of news and something that's kind of hard to talk around. I do know that people ask you about this all the time, so I just want you to tell us in your own words with as little or as much detail as you'd like about what happened that night. Well, I appreciate that very much. Um, from our correspondence, you've been extremely respectful um, of letting me handle how I want to discuss the story. Yeah. Um, and that's, I respect it so much and I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, so I'd like to take you back to kind of how we met because yeah. we met from porn. Mm -hmm. um, John had been, War Machine had been tweeting me because Twitter was huge back then in, yeah. in 2013. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Woo. Um, he had been tweeting me and I never gave him any sort of attention. I was a very private person. I still am a very private person, but back then I didn't want to be involved with anyone with any notoriety. I didn't want to distract myself from, you know, saving up my nest egg and preparing for my future. But eventually I gave in when I got an offer from Hustler. Hustler said, uh, the magazine, they said, we have an opportunity to shoot with this guy who's an MMA fighter, but the only way he will do the photo shoot is if you're in it too. And I said, well, how much are you going to pay me? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, we were hoping that it would just be, you know, a, a trade for, for publishing. And I was like, it sounds like Hustler. Absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> I, I like, I, I love Hustler. I love Larry, but yeah. That yeah. Sounds like them. No. So, um, I was like, well, if you want to, actually take this seriously and you want either of us or mm -hmm. both of us, mm -hmm. you're going to have to pay me. So they ended up paying me. We did the shoot and I met him and he was a very intense character, mm -hmm. um, like a larger than life personality, loud, um, just very fun. Mm -hmm. And he was very respectful of me and my boundaries on that shoot. I was a little under the weather. This is before, I think it was a few days before my 21st birthday, 20th or 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And I had just moved out to Vegas. I was under the weather. It turns out I had pneumonia and kidney stones. Oh, man. Yeah, that was fun. But I was young and afraid of doctors. So <laughs> yeah, you're like, I, I can sick. handle this. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I got sick. And he, um, at the shoot, he was like, hey, I'm a little worried, you know, that you're not feeling well can I come and check in on you later? And I was like, oh, that's very nice, actually. Like, mm -hmm. that'd be that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, you can come over to my hotel room, but we're not having sex. Yeah. And that was like the, the first thing I laid it out. Like, we're yeah. not we're not having sex. We just banged <laughs> for, for this magazine. We're not uh -huh. we're not doing that. Um, and he said, OK, that's fine. Let me bring you some food. Make sure you're OK. And so he did. And we kept in contact and we were texting. He made sure that I got back to Vegas OK. Uh, because I had driven back and forth and we just kept in contact and my mom was like, wow, that's a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. like, he's really looking out for you and making sure you're all right. Like maybe you should look into this a little more. Mm -hmm. And within the next two months, he had just love bombed me and made me feel like the most important person in the world, really put me up on a pedestal, told me he would do anything for me. Um, and he had been pursuing me for well over a year at this point. So I truly believed it. And from there, it just blew up. We decided to enter in a relationship. 
and we went public with it within a couple of months. Everyone loved it. It was salacious, you know, a porn star and an MMA star, mm -hmm. um, really just being messy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because everyone loves a messy couple on Twitter. Yeah. Like we live for it. And I was the messy couple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was young and I was jealous because, you know, he would hit on other women and this whole time he was sleeping with other women and I didn't know. I I suspected I, I suspected it. Yeah. it. But um and I was jealous and I, and I, so I would go on Twitter and be like, "How dare you?" I'm leaving you on mm -hmm. Twitter. And mm -hmm. it's like, I'm 21 years old. Yeah. Like, I was, uh, 21 year olds should not have access to the internet. Yeah. Um, and so we would go back and forth on and off couple for a few months. And the first time that he hit me, um, we had just gotten back from a trip and something had set him off that he had seen on Twitter. His roommate was giving us a ride back to his apartment. We were in the back seat. And he slapped the shit out of me wow. right in front of his roommate and his roommate just parked the car and left and just left him in the backseat hitting me. And I was like, oh, it makes you feel like a big man hit me again. And I would I would say things like that because yeah. that's what gave me power. It's what made me feel like I was more in control right. of the situation. Right. Like, OK, do it again. You think you're hurting me? Do it again then. Make yeah. you feel like a big man. Yeah. Um, and so then I would leave him and then he would send me flowers or something and tell me he was sorry and bring me food again and just show me attention, positive attention. Mm -hmm. And then I'd fall back into the ways because I was so young and I had never seen any domestic violence in my life before. I didn't think that it was happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, I was conflating his abuse with passion. Yeah. Um, and if he cares about me this much enough to really hurt me, like I just, I, the ways that I was kind of validating it yeah. in my own mind, I can't see why I was thinking that way then. Yeah. But, you know, in retrospect, everything is easier and I should have left and I should have stayed away. Yeah. And there are so many things that I could have done differently. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to say that like over a decade later, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, over the next year or so, we would go back and forth in and out of the relationship and he would hit me usually open handed mm -hmm. um, and choke me out and, you know, things like that, very serious things. But to me, I was like, oh, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. And he had ended up breaking a couple of my teeth, uh, like chipping them and, you know, left bruises all of the time. And I still kept coming back. Yeah. And then I made the decision to really leave him. Mm -hmm. And we had completely separated our things. He lived in San Diego. I lived in Las Vegas. Um, Were you scared to leave him? Like, did he ever threaten to hurt you if you left him? Always. Okay. Um, I remember laying in bed with him in San Diego. And after one blowout over a straightener of all things, a hair straightener, um, he had tossed me into his fireplace and broke off a tile on my forehead. Um, and I remember laying in his bed, screaming, crying in so much pain. And he told me like, I will kill you. I have friends in the Hells Angels. I will send them after you and your family. You will die. Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. And he told me this different versions and he would um, I don't know if he was actually texting people or just pretending to text people. He's like, I'm going to tell him right now. And, you know, you don't know how to react like that with yeah. that fear looming over you at all times. You yeah. don't know what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. You don't know what kind of powers or persuasion he has um, as another public figure. So it, it, I just, I stayed. So I was very afraid of him. Mm -hmm. Um 
but I did make the decision to leave and I started seeing another guy. I cut it out with I cut it off with him and kept a friendship with him. And that with in, John. Uh, not with John. Oh, okay. Um, with, with, with the, the other guy seeing. that I was seeing. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> and he lived in Las Vegas as well. And mm-hmm. this is the man that John also attempted to kill. Mm-hmm. Um, so that night, I was texting with John, flirting with him. It was very common for us, like, because we had that on and off relationship yeah. for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. So I was texting with John, and then I was supposed to do a, a like a signing at a casino the next day. Mm-hmm. So my friend that I had previously been seeing stayed over with me. He was going to help me set up the next day, mm-hmm. and John broke into my house and just started going to town. He started beating my friend, and I called the police. The police didn't come. I just... Uh, tried call ag- tried calling again, um, and then very quickly deleted the calls from my phone because I knew he was coming for me next. Um, Jesus Christ! I. I mean, did the cops say they were coming? I wasn't like listening on the phone. I was. You can hear the nine one one calls online. Uh-huh. Um, there's just a lot of screaming mostly, yeah. um, but I deleted the phone calls. Because I knew he was going to go through my phone. Right. Uh, it was a very common thing for him to do. Right. <clears throat> so after that, I don't know how in depth you would like me to go with the story. <laughs> like, whatever you want. Whatever you want to say. Yeah. This is not um, new information. Yeah. Like this is you know very publicly available online. Right. Um. But he essentially let my friend go. My friend didn't end up calling the police. Um, he just went home. He just just left. (laughs) He just left. He He just just left left you in the house. Yeah. With with the man that he knew had beaten me previously. So he knew what was going to happen. Right. Um, and John had actually attacked me before he had left the house because there's no way he had gotten to the door in the amount of time that it took. Right. Yeah. And then John was in the house torturing me and beating me for hours um so at any time like i was just hoping the police would show up nothing um and i had to sorry i'm gonna cry no no it's okay We can also stop at any time. No, it's all right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I remember laying on the floor. <laughs> trying to give him reasons not to kill me. And eventually, I thought he was seeing reason, and I thought he was going to leave. Um, He took my phone and went downstairs into my kitchen. And I could hear him going through my drawers. And he was looking for a knife to kill me with. And I just knew I had to get up and leave that house. Um, I was naked. I was bleeding everywhere. And I ended up escaping and uh, just running down the streets, knocking on doors. It's 3 a.m. Nobody's letting me in. And I thought, you know, this is going to give him another opportunity to come after me. He's going to find me. Um... And eventually, one of the houses let me hide behind a bush in their front yard. <laughs> they let you, so they didn't let you in, and but they let you let me hide. into the house. Jesus Christ. Um, I had three people come to their <clears throat> doors, um, but nobody would open the door. No one would let me in. Um, so I eventually passed out behind their bush. Um, 
got into an ambulance and I remember waking up in the hospital and it was later confirmed all of my knives were laid out on my counter. He was looking for a knife to kill me with. Oh my God. <laughs> but honestly, I don't, I wouldn't take back anything that's happened to me mm -hmm. because it's given me a voice. It's yeah. given me a purpose. It has allowed me to help so many more people in similar, if not worse situations than I was in, mm -hmm. um, find their own voices and make an escape before what happened to me happens to them. Yeah. And that's, it makes it all, I don't want to say it makes it worth it, but yeah. it does. It makes me feel better for knowing I've made a positive impact on people's lives through my own suffering. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like that, you know, that real human purpose to be able to take something that's so incredibly traumatic and so painful and turn that around and use that experience to help other people. Like that's an incredibly rewarding experience. Oh, and, absolutely. and the strength that you have to take that and turn it around in that way is like incredibly remarkable. Thank you. And so it's almost like, I don't know if you believe in, in fate or anything like that. It's almost like, I don't want to even say God cause I'm not a religious person, but you were given this horrible experience that you were able to survive because you were strong enough to survive. And now you can use that to help other people. I don't know. I feel like I'm not articulating this properly, but I, I understand what you're saying and I, I appreciated it. It really almost gives me a, a purpose, yeah. <laughs> which is like the one thing that I think human beings look for in everything yeah. subconsciously or consciously. Yeah. We all want a purpose. We all want to feel like we're giving back to the world in some way. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I have felt through my experiences. Um, even to this day, I get women messaging me through Instagram telling me that they decided to leave their abusive relationship because they saw me continue to live my life yeah. and not be ashamed of who I am and stand up to my abuser. Because not everyone gets that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, especially in my case, I was scared to go to court because I know how sex workers are treated. Yeah. I know how I've always been treated. I didn't think I was going to be taken seriously at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, and I was validated in my experiences, and I was validated um, through everything. They really threw the book at him and gave him the time that he deserved. And I wish everyone else got that opportunity, especially other sex workers and victims of abuse. There's so many abusers that don't get... Even probation. Yeah. They will spend one night in jail and then go back home. In the most dangerous time for a victim of domestic abuse is when they leave their abuser. Yeah. Uh, it, statistically, it, raises the odds exponentially of them being murdered by their abuser. Yeah. And I'm lucky that I survived, but I know so many other women that haven't. Yeah. And, and the part that you said about, you know, sex workers not being believed. I mean, so often you, you hear that whole, like, well, you know, you're a whore, you deserved it or like, Oh, every day, yeah. even even now, I got what I deserved. He should have finished the job. If I wasn't such a whore, this wouldn't have happened to me. If I wouldn't have been such a slut, yeah. you know, this would have never happened. But John did porn. Yeah. Is he not? Is, is he exempt from the slut shaming because he's a man? Yeah. Is he exempt from the kind of negativity? based on sex work because why? Because he's a man or because he's an MMA fighter or because what? Because he's an abuser and you identify with him in some way. I, I just don't understand. 
Yeah, I mean, it really shines a light on the hypocrisy in terms of like the way that the different sexes are viewed. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, the story blew up almost immediately after it happened. Um, first of all, going through such an incredibly awful experience and then being in the news and having it be everywhere. How did that affect like your physical and emotional healing? Like, was there a part of you that wished that you didn't have so much notoriety, that it wasn't in the news or did it being in the news make you feel like, okay, now people finally know what's been happening to me? I wish that I wasn't as notable as I was. I wanted to suffer in private. I wanted to take my time and heal, but I couldn't. There, I never even got to go back to the house that I was living in because the information that was supposed to be redacted <clears throat> was released. My address, my full name, my phone number, everything. Um, because it was a sexually based crime, or not sexually based, but because I was raped, mm -hmm. the police weren't supposed to release my identity, but they ended up releasing absolutely everything. So I was never able to go back to that house. Um, I had to find a, a safe house to go to because John was still on the run for a week mm -hmm. um, after I was released from the hospital. Mm -hmm. There, I just wanted to be left alone, essentially. I just wanted to be alone. Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't be. There yeah. were so many questions coming from Twitter, from Instagram. I was getting emails. My mom was being harassed and yeah. my mom didn't know what to say. She didn't know who to talk to and what was okay to say. Um, and it was just very invasive. Yeah. And very traumatic. <laughs> yeah. Usually when cases like this go to court, both sides are very quiet about details because of legal reasons. But you were very outspoken about what happened and you even responded directly to people who accused you of lying. Why, how did, why did you feel empowered to do that? I wanted my story to be told. I wanted to be told correctly. Um, I didn't want things to get skewed because they get... One person will say one thing, mm -hmm. and then it becomes fact. Yeah. And I didn't want that to happen. I wanted my truth to be told directly from me. I didn't want, you know, someone that was a friend of John's uncle or something that, you know, has a connection to someone to say whatever, and then all of a sudden that's the truth. Yeah. I wanted the truth to come from me. Yeah. I mean, you... Yeah, it's the problem is is when you do stay quiet about situations like that, then you lose control of the narrative, right? And you're right. Oh, like, absolutely. It's like because the media is so hungry for information, mm -hmm. they'll talk to anybody. And by the time I was even released from the hospital, John had gone on a tweeting spree saying that he was attacked, that I had attacked him, and he had to stand up for himself and – and that's, you know, what people were running with at that time. So I had to say something. Yeah. Well, and it, which is a crazy thing to say, considering the extent of your industry, industry, the extent of your injuries as well. I mean, was yeah. It 18 broken bones. Yeah. My um, orbital bone was completely shattered. My nose was shattered. Um, I'm, I have, my whole mouth is fake teeth. These are implants. Um, the rest are crowns from my teeth being broken in half. Um, he had kicked me so hard in the side that he ruptured my liver and fractured a rib. My, and I couldn't walk on my left leg for the longest time. I don't know what happened um, because there were several, several blank spaces in my memory. Yeah. Um, there, there was a bruise that was easily this big and just purple and black, I couldn't walk on my leg. So luckily, like, my leg wasn't broken, but my face was totally unrecognizable. Even the face that I have now today is so different than the face that I had then. Yeah. Um, and it was really challenging to look in the mirror and not only deal with seeing a totally different person looking back at me, but not feeling like the same person either. Mm -hmm. So... It was just a very conflicting time for me to try and merge 
who I was and who I am now into one person. Yeah. And I imagine that you've gone through like a huge metamorphosis since that happened. So it's kind of crazy that that is reflected physically in your face as well as I imagine mentally and inside of you. Oh, absolutely. So what do you see when you look in the mirror now? I have completely come to terms with what I look like and who I am. Um, now when I look in the mirror, I physically, I still see a beautiful woman, but it's not who I was. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at pictures from, you know, 2013 and pictures of me now, um, totally different woman. And it's not just aging. Um, it's a totally different nose. My eye shape is different. My mouth shape is different. I don't have lip injections or anything, um, but I have a huge scar that goes through my lip. Um, and it's... I, well, I have come to terms with what I look like. Like, I'm still a pretty pretty woman, but hey, it's beautiful. not, thank you, but it's not how I would choose to look. Right. And then non-physically, I see someone that has been through a lot. And, you know, with the scars that I deal with, um, I, I just see an, a strong woman. Yeah. Who are your biggest support systems during your recovery and your trial? I had and still have amazing friends and familial support. My brother and my mom were there for me every step of the way. And all of my friends really just stood behind me and lifted me up and gave me all of the support that I could have needed in any way that I asked for. Um, and also complete strangers on the internet. Um, I gained so many new friendships from people that really went to bat for me on Twitter. Um, and to this day, we're still connected because of the support and the love that they gave to me, a, a, a perfect stranger. Mm -hmm. And they really just took me and my cause under their wing. And it's beautiful to really see people that have absolutely no connection to me yeah. really stand behind me. Yeah, isn't it incredible when you can like have that connection, you can touch other people that you've never met before. Yeah, and really they showed their support through everything. Yeah. What did you, what was the recovery like in terms of just like emotionally? Because clearly like this is such a traumatic experience. I imagine you had some PTSD afterwards. Yeah. What were the steps that you went through to, to come back and regain a sense of yourself again? It's hard to say exactly what I did and to say that I am, you know, a fully Healed, healed person. person. Yeah. Um, I have done years of therapy with different therapists. I have taken any kind of step that anyone would suggest to take um, through things that they've been through, dealing with PTSD, dealing with any sort of traumatic experience. Mostly for me, I just chose the route of seclusion. Um, yeah. And I just did self-healing and self-soothing. Um, I dealt with many rounds of depression um, and still do. Like I'm still, I still have depression. I'm still mm -hmm. a depressed person and I'm always going to be. Um, I don't think that any kind of pill will heal me or any kind of therapist can be like, oh, she's mir a miracle, she's fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and many rounds of you know, suicidal ideation. And I've, I wouldn't say that I'm healed from it, mm -hmm. but it's something that I'm working on every day. Yeah. God, a decade later, you know, and it's still just, I mean, I would imagine that will stay with you forever. Oh, absolutely. It will. It is a piece of me. While I am a multifaceted person, as we all are, yeah. that is one of my facets and that has become part of my identity. What would you say to other women who are dealing with domestic violence in their own lives? It's hard to tell people what they should do, but it is worth it to leave no matter how hard it is. And I understand the dangers. There is so much more to life 
there's so much more beauty that you can experience without that person holding you down. Mm -hmm. You are worth it. You are loved. You have a future. Yeah. Do you feel, so John got, is it life in prison that he got? Yeah, 36 to life. And do you feel like, did that help with the healing at all? Like, did you feel vindicated at all? The only thing that I think it helped for me personally was knowing that other people can get that kind of sentencing for domestic violence now, mm -hmm. um, especially sex workers. That's almost unheard of for the kind of situation that it was yeah. uh, to receive that much time. Um, and it was a horrific case, but there are so many worse cases that have even resulted in death that do not receive that kind of punishment. Right. Um, so while it doesn't affect me mentally healing at all to see him receive that kind of jail time, it makes me rest better knowing that others can receive the same. Yeah. He tried to issue an apology to you after he went to prison. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't put any stock into anything that he would say. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about him now? I don't feel anything about him. I don't think about him. Um, while the whole situation is a part of me and forever will be, mm -hmm. I do not, I don't focus on it. I don't focus on him mm -hmm. mostly. People like to say that he's a monster or that abusers are monsters, but he's just a man. He's just a person. He is not the boogeyman. He's not um, some sort of monster in the closet that no one knows about and shouldn't be talked about. And he's not a secret. He's just a man. Yeah. Um, so it's, he just is another person to me. It's like you don't want to give him that kind of power by oh, absolutely. You know, giving him that title of like, he's a monster. He's, you're right. He's, he's just another human being. Yeah. Extremely flawed. Yeah. Extremely flawed human being. Absolutely. You have now started, um, how long, when did you start coming back to modeling? Um, I don't really remember. I know that I took a few pictures, did a few photo shoots in 2015 and 2016. And I didn't start going into um, like videos and modeling like that again until 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really took me that long to really kind of find my sexual identity again yeah. and really become Christy Mack, feeling like Christy Mack again. Yeah, that must have been really hard. Yeah. Is it, did it feel like rewarding though, knowing that you were able to like start to feel like a woman again, like a sexual creature again? Um, I wouldn't say that it was like rewarding in any way. I, mm. I just feel like I finally became more comfortable with myself and my body and my face again. Yeah. Um, and it just took me that long to become really comfortable with who I am. Yeah. Um, Christy, you're amazing. I don't like, this is such a hard thing to talk about, and I really appreciate you being so open. Thank you. I, I love answering questions about it because I don't want it to be a secret for anyone. Yeah. I think domestic violence should be talked about openly. I don't think it should be a shame. I think if it was more acceptable to speak freely about domestic violence, women wouldn't suffer in silence. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean... And they'd be taken more seriously. I mean, I just still can't believe that the cops never came. Yeah. Did you ever get an answer as to why? No. Um, when the cops went on the stand, I was told by the prosecutor that was handling my case, like, mm -hmm. we have to make it look like they were doing their job because we want the reciprocity between the agencies so we can't make it look like the cops were doing bad things and this and that. And I was like... So you're kind of admitting that, like, they should have shown up. They should have, yeah, maybe shown <laughs> like, up when yeah. you called about being yeah. attacked and allegedly, screaming in the background. Yeah, allegedly they went to the neighbor's house and the neighbor was like, hey, we're good here, but we know next door there's huge problems. Right. Um, and they just, they didn't even bother checking in on it or anything. Oh, my God. That's yeah. crazy.
that's just insane. So Christy, what um what are your future goals? What do you what what's going on like in your life now? Like what are you looking forward to? Um Honestly, I want to have a little farmstead in the middle of nowhere, and I want to rescue all of the dogs that I can. I want a couple of cows, a few chickens. I want to live my quiet life again <laughs> and just be me. I just want to... Bake some pies? Yeah, bake some pies <laughs> and keep shooting, you know, my little solo and girl-girl content for mm -hmm. OnlyFans and just continue to be me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and again, like speaking so openly about this. Um, you're such an inspiration to me and, you know, other women, especially who've experienced similar situations, especially as a sex worker. I mean, you pointed out, you know, the the stigma around around that chosen profession has, I know, prevented so many women from speaking out about abuse that they've endured. So absolutely. I mean, thank God for people like you. Thank you so much. And thank you for making me cry. No. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> I didn't want that to happen. Oh, no. It's a, it's honestly, every time I cry, it's like, a, I feel a little more healed. You yeah. Because like, sometimes I'll get through the entire story without crying. And sometimes, you know, I'll cry five minutes in. Other times I'll cry an hour in. But it's, it's, it's all part of the healing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it makes me feel more human. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, all right. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Absolutely. I am on Instagram at Christy Mac, Twitter at Christy Mac, OnlyFans at Christy Mac, and also unofficial Christy on Instagram and OnlyFans. And that's kind of it. Fantastic. <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and listen to the bonus little Q&A we're going to do, um, make sure that you join at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you next time. <laughs>